Good morning, um, dear friends, your excellencies, um, professors. Uh, it's always great to be around uh, Professor Mislives and Jody Jensen because you feel a real human being who has got some thoughts and have some time for thinking. Because otherwise working, uh, obviously, in different jobs related to government means that you are on, in a hurry all the time. Uh, like this night I was just solving some problems in Cyprus with our peacekeeping troops. So this is uh, always a momentum uh, when you see friends and when you have really time uh, to put your experiences and thoughts together. Uh, it is a great honor and privilege for me to be, in a way, associated with ISIS. Although today I always have to explain everyone that's not the ISIS. And, and frankly, Professor, this is a problem. No, frankly, this is a problem because you, really, you have now this idea what ISIS is. And of course, I keep telling them ISIS has been funded, you know, more, more many years before. But we talk about, sadly, all the terrorism uh, accomplished by ISIS. So um, I was asked to give a lecture. I took it seriously. And besides, first of all, I would like to welcome Professor Mislivets, whom I'm reminding him what he has to do with UNESCO, because he asked, you know, what UNESCO is doing. But I'm reminding him now. He is in the Intergovernmental Council <coughs> since 2013. I was there at the election. I actually proposed him because I thought we need uh, creative thinkers in this uh, group of uh, people uh, talking about uh, management of social transformation. So uh, this is up to the members, really, to, uh, to, to find a way how we are going forward. He is also the chair of the UNESCO Hungarian National Committee of Social Sciences since 2012, so he can shape the way again. And it was a great honor in 2011 when Kurseg, uh, Isis, and Corvinus became UNESCO uh, chair for cultural heritage management and sustainability. Uh, so uh, these, these are wonderful experiences uh, and in terms of the relationship with, within UNESCO and Kurseg, Isis, and Professor Mislivets himself. And of course, it's a great honor always for me to meet uh, the president of the Hungarian National Commission of UNESCO, Professor Miklos Réthei, uh, the former minister of uh, human resources, whom I have been working together for many years. We have cooked together wonderful conferences, ideas, and he's such a visionary uh, thinker and uh, uh, someone who has got real heart. Uh, and that is what he's taking into the life of UNESCO. And it's a great joy for me to, uh, to meet again uh, His Excellency Mr. Zoltán Csefalvai, who is now the Hungarian representative uh, in UNESCO as an ambassador, but he is the permanent representative at the OECD as well. Today, these two posts are together, so OECD and UNESCO, two multilateral diplomatic scenes are working together in that sense. So, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was asked to talk about the UN, which celebrates its 70th anniversary this year. This year, we commemorate a key moment in the history of international relations uh, after the second post-war era, the creation uh, when, of course, we can talk about an extraordinary progress since 1945 in terms of cooperation. We normally don't do that because we always talk about the difficulties, but just think what we have accomplished in uh, peace, security, the freedom of nations, human rights, development, fight diseases, advanced education, health, women's and children's rights, and technology, I would say are among the areas that have made a quantum leap in history of humankind. At the time of inception, what we have been doing now in New York, 
The scale and the spread of violence, destruction, and devastation prompted the international community to pledge to free succeeding generation from the scourges of war. However, in the subsequent seven decades, there have been numerous failings to live up to this pledge. Efforts of prevention of war crimes, crimes against humanity and the genocide, including early warning and early action remain as important as ever. The membership that time was 51. Today is 193, plus we have two observer states, the Holy See and Palestine. In UNESCO, it's 195, because I was the president when we took Palestine and South Sudan in 2011. This stands proof of the proliferation of the right of the peoples uh, to freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Today, I would say no country says isolate, isolated from the increasingly globalized world. Countries, big or small, developed or less developed, landlocked or islands, have experienced in growing difficulties in protecting themselves from the imbalances that transcend national boundaries and regions. Working together has become more and more important. We know that. We believe that the United Nations remains the world's only plausible setting where all voices can be heard. A lot has to be done, but a lot more needs to be achieved in reflection of the ever-changing reality as well. Every year, every day, I would say every hour, we face new challenges in the United Nations, and we have to cope with these new dangers. Um, I remember when I presented my credentials on the 20th of January this year to uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, I said, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, United Nations, and it's probably because I was former journalist, it is so abstract and people really don't understand what the United Nations is doing. And if we want to have the world leaders working with us, we have to make people interested in our work because world leaders are interested in votes. Now, if the people are not really interested, they are not really concentrating enough on the work of United Nations. So I told him it's high time to translate what we are doing. So I consider myself only a translator. But there is a lot to do for a translator as well. When I spoke the first time in the Security Council in January, I frankly told all my colleagues whom I listened to since the beginning of the month that there is no dialogue whatsoever. Everyone speaks, everyone has a message, and then walks out. This is what we have to change. Uh, there are three uh, very important areas the United Nations is dealing with in New York. Of course, this is development, this is the security, peace and security, and the human rights. And as we know, as Mandela said, there is no development without human rights, and there is no uh, peace without development. So uh, all these uh, parts uh, work together. Um, we had this year two high-level weeks, um, and that was all related to the 70th session of the General Assembly. Between the 25th and 27th September, we had the so-called Sustainable Development Summit. I'm sure you all heard about the Sustainable Development Goals. I will talk a little bit later. And on the week of the 28th of September, world leaders shared their vision about the most pressing problems of their countries, the world, and how they see the UN. So, as we say, the circles came to town twice. The life in New York during the high-level week, this time weeks, is unbearable. Convoys, traffic jams, 1,000 secret agents, not to mention police in cars, on horses, bicycles, even on bikes, and actually you just can't move. 
And we ambassadors are sweating and trying to act as magicians because we have got new and new obstacles and wishes from our politicians and leaders. And we are all waiting for the smell of the aerosol, so the departure time. And yes, this year everybody came from the world, all the leaders who probably hasn't been, haven't been there for 10 years. Royals, celebrities, heads of states, heads of governments, foreign ministers, and even the Holy Father. Can you imagine the city? The Holy Father and Barack Obama plus Putin at the same time in the city. Now, what the Holy Father said was really setting the tone of this world gathering. His message was the following. The history of this organized community of states is one of an important common achievement over a period of unusually fast-paced changes. Without claiming to be exhaustive, we can mention the codification and development of international law, the establishment of international norms regarding human rights, advances in humanitarian law, the resolution of numerous conflicts, operations of peacekeeping and reconciliation, and any number of other accomplishments in every area of international activity and endeavor. The Pope spoke out against partisan interests, the culture of waste, selfishness, inequality, and exclusion that are the root causes for the biggest global problems. He spoke strongly in favor of, of observing ethical norms and practical considerations in order to safeguard the environment and thereby ensure the future of mankind. So let's start with development, with sustainable development. It was, of course, most welcome that on the first week, the Sustainable Development Summit um, was very successful because all the representatives, all the heads of governments and states have expressed their firm support for the agenda. We have 17 sustainable development goals and in the core lie uh, the interrelated SDGs, the 169 targets that we should ensure the interplay between the economic social and environmental pillars in each and every goal. I won't go into details, but I just want to give a picture what are we talking about. If we truly want to secure our common future and poverty and hunger by 2030 and ensure prosperity for all, now is the time to start turning words into action by mobilizing stakeholders governments, private sectors, international and regional organizations, NGOs, academia, both North and the South to take responsibility and contribute their fair share to the implementation. Only through the establishment of this true global partnership can our aspiration be met. The agenda is the result of common understanding that current economic, social, and environmental trends, if they continue unchallenged and unchanged, will doom our planet. For the first time, member states agree that only sustainable development is development. For development, which is not, sustain un is, is not sustainable, <clears throat> is nothing else but temporary improvement. The agenda represents the paradigm of change of the 21st century, the words overall prosperity and states' own interests are interdependent, therefore cannot be achieved at the cost of the others. Which are these goals? The 2030 development plan concentrates on ending poverty and hunger, ensuring healthy lives and inclusive, inclusive education, on gender equality, and providing water and sanitation for all, on access to energy for all and productive employment, 
on reducing inequality within and among countries and fostering innovation. The plan talks about what makes a city sustainable, how to ensure sustainable consumption and take urgent action to combat climate change, how to conserve oceans, protect our ecosystem, and it promotes peaceful and inclusive societies. Of course, it is an abstract and beautiful vision, and hopefully in the coming 15 years, the vision turns into action, and for that we need the political will. But just think, uh, for example, since the agreement was signed by all the world leaders, and there is on the SDG 10, where we are talking about the phenomena of migration. The agenda, first and foremost, provides comprehensive approaches addressing the root causes, so migration doesn't have to occur. The agenda aims to end poverty and to provide sustainable economic, environmental, social circumstances so that people can strive in their own countries. The agenda acknowledges the role of migration in development. In order to turn the current challenge into opportunity, the agenda calls for orderly, safe, regulated, and responsible migration. So the very agenda received resounding support and was adopted by acclamation by all the world leaders, but the global solution for the recent mass, mass migration is very far away from agreed vision under the SDGs, what we have just signed. What it says, facilitate responsible, responsible mobility of people, including through the implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies. So what I'm saying, it's a beautiful and abstract vision. And of course, when we come to reality, we have to find a ways how, ca how we can really sort of continue the track, what we agreed on. There is a constant question going on. Uh, is the UN a reflection of hu human development? And I would say yes, it is. The UN actually is the reflection of the world. And when we talk why the UN is not working or how the UN is working, we have to take into consideration how the world is working or not working. So actually I believe it is really a reflection of the world. And the UN deals with peace and security, human rights and development, so we should never forget that the strengths and accomplishments, just like the weaknesses and failures of the organization, are our common responsibility. In other words, the capacity of the UN to act or not to act is nothing but the reflection of the will and determination of its member states. And we should not forget it's an intergovernmental organization. We always have the question, is the UN fit for purpose? Is it transparent, inclusive, or efficient? Um, it has been also expressed by almost all the heads of state and government at the recent general debate of the 70th session that we are living in an age of global turmoil. Large-scale conflicts have tripled since 2008. More than 60 million people have been forcibly displaced and most since the, the, most since the Second World War. The conflicts in the Middle Eastern and North African region, the chronic instability of fragile states and regions, for example, Sudan, South Sudan, and Somalia, dominate the discussions in the area of peace and security. Regional, regionalization, intrastate conflicts, emergence of non-state actors, the spread of radicalism and violent extremism, international terrorism, foreign terrorist fighters, international organized crime, make it even more difficult to face the challenges of today. The general observation of the UN membership is that the UN still has a pivotal role in maintaining peace and security.
Now, let me just go back to the word leaders I was talking about who all came to town. Just a few quotes, because they all want different things. So what the UN can do about that? Uh, the general debate is always started by Brazil. And uh, the president, Dilma Rousseff, said the reason for the large-scale refugee crisis is the spread of regional conflicts and terrorism. Some countries have destroyed state institutions through military action, contrary to international law, thus allowing space for terrorism. The US President Barack Obama said, very interesting, especially to the news of today, what Mr. Putin is talking about, according to some and contrary to the US position, the goals of the UN Charter are unattainable and outdated in today's context. International relations are a zero-sum game, and therefore international order can only be maintained through the use of force. But the US rejects violence-based politics and settlement of the Syrian conflict according to the Russian agenda. Cooperation with Assad does not solve the problem. That's what Mr. Obama says. The Chinese president says, in the spirit of multilateralism, countries must seek a global partnership. And the world must create a security system based on justice, common contributions, and shared benefits. But what the Russian president says, many criticize the UN and the Security Council for not being effective enough and for failing to agree on basic questions, but such differences has always existed, have always existed, as he says, which is actually true. Every member has used the veto. We can talk about that. But you have to accept that each country, as Mr. Putin says, follows its own path of development and dissemination of ideals preferred by some lead to the destruction of national institutions. The resulting power vacuum has caused anarchy in several Middle Eastern and North African countries. And what the French president says, rapid creation of a broad coalition is required to resolve the Syrian conflict, but Zuma, the president of South Africa, says the migrants' crisis was caused by arming of the civil people. And president of Poland says that the increasingly frequent attacks against Christian minorities in the Middle East are really concerning. The Iranian president says the nuclear agreement opened a new chapter in the relations between Israel and other countries, but Prime Minister Netanyahu said, despite the restrictions in the Iran nuclear agreement, Iran is on the verge of becoming a nuclear state once the agreement expires in 10, 50 years, and Israel will not allow this. I'm just saying that these are the political leaders of the world. So the UN can only work with the political leaders, and the final word, when we do anything in the Security Council, goes back to the leaders of the world. According to the UN Charter, the Security Council is responsible for maintenance of international peace and security. Through its constant meetings, closed consultation, open briefings by members of the UN Secretariat, debates open to all the UN membership to participate to, the work of its different subsidiary bodies, such as the various sanctions committees, and so on. And this is the, what is admittingly doing every day, all year round, even at Christmas time. As the permanent representative of Hungary, we are not member of the Security um, Council at the moment, but I really believe that you have to have a voice. All countries can have a voice, so you can participate in open debates. And just in the past few months, I delivered a lot of uh, messages and statements, not only about the lack of the dialogue, but about um, the protection of civilians, women, peace and security of the children, the ethnic and religious minorities in the Middle East, and so on. 
And it is a common view among member states that the UN has major problems with responding to current conflicts. Despite the robust efforts, the demand for peacekeeping has grown in the recent years with 87% of UN peacekeepers deployed in Africa. But there are, of course, topics which, means for, which mean for us we are in a deadlock. That's the Syrian situation. For example, and there are topics where we can have results. Ultimately, the Security Council will have to break the deadlock and come up with political solutions. Uh, it will take still time if we talk about Iraq, Syria, or Libya. And we know that there is no military solution to these conflicts. And therefore, the transatlantic community and Russia have to cooperate. World readers agree that the spread of terrorism and violent extremism is a common threat that should be tackled by united efforts. You know in the Security Council there are five, the P5 countries, uh, United States, Russia, France, uh, United Kingdom, and China, and they can veto anything. There is a big movement going on now. Uh, Hungary is very uh, strongly uh, contributing in it. We are trying uh, to pursue the P5 members not to use their veto uh, in the times of genocide. And of course, we have seen different uh, historic moments when the Security Council did not act accordingly. Just remember what happened in Rwanda or Srebrenica, or even in 1956 uh, here in Hungary. Of course, there is real politic and there is the UN because actually the Iran deal has been uh, cooked outside the UN because the UN couldn't agree on that. Uh, but I personally believe in the prevention. I really um, talk about the importance of preventive diplomacy and the importance of criminal justice. Uh, an excellent opportunity to address these issues is through the various ongoing reform processes of the UN peace operations, the UN peace building mechanism, and the implementation of the Security Council Resolution 1325. This is on women, peace, and security. We have the UN women set up by the Secretary General, and we can see a lot of uh, results in this area. I really believe in partnership with regional actors and organizations, and I really believe that the Security Council must leave behind the silo mentality and build stronger interdependence between the Council members. Uh, but there are some positive results as well, because I did speak about peace and security, I did speak about uh, development, uh, and of course, we have a big hope in terms of the sustainable development goals. But there are really positive results in the third pillar, and this is human rights. Because uh, just after three years of uh, the birth of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948. And uh, the UN has placed human rights at the center of its activities. Since 1945, a series of international human rights treaties have been adopted under the auspices of the UN, including on civil and political rights, the, prohibi the prohibition of torture, the elimination of racism. The adoption of these treaties played a groundbreaking role in empowering the voiceless <coughs> segments of society, children, women, youth, ethical and racial minorities and persons with disabilities. By imposing strict measures, including an arms embargo, the United Nations was also a major factor in bringing about the downfall of the apartheid system in South Africa. Thanks to the work of the UN Commission on Status of Women and the creation of the UN Women, Women's rights are today acknowledged as fundamental human rights. Uh, 
The Convention on the Rights of Child, adopted in 80, 1989, changed the way children are threatened, treated, and became the most widely ratified international human rights treaty in the history. Despite, of course, these achievements, the human rights system faces significant challenges and has even at times failed miserable, miserably, as I just said, remember the massacres in Rwanda, Bosnia, Herzegovina, or the Sri Lankan war. Uh, we have been working uh, very strongly in the Children Not Soldiers campaign. Chad has been taken off the UN Secretary General's list of child recruiters, and over 400 children were released from the army in Myanmar. After the massacres in 1990, the International Criminal Court was created to bring perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity to justice. In 2013, the U.S. Secretary General launched the Human Rights Upfront Initiative. In the Human Rights Council, UN member states have agreed to submit themselves to international scrutiny and to periodically report on their human rights record through the so-called Universal Periodic Review. I know that was only just what you heard, a kind of uh, summary of important segments of the work we have been doing there. So I want to finish uh, my uh, presentation with the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you very much. <laughs>